Alright, hello everyone. This is the third week of Husky Game Development. Uh, quick heads up is I accidentally deleted the video that I recorded during the actual session, so I'm going to be re-recording it today. So if I miss anything, please leave a comment and I'll make sure to answer your questions. So where we ended up leaving off was right about here last week, which is where we have our character who can move around, jump, and there is a basic black background. So now the next thing that we're going to work on today is actually putting bullets in the game to make it a little more fun to play. And if you guys have not seen this video, I'd suggest watching it. It's in the slides. And this was something that happened last night, but now it's pointless for me to say about anything about it. So the next thing that we're going to do is be putting bullets into our game. So visit one of the two links that are on the bottom here, which will both take you to the Google Drive or to my website, which you then can get to Google Drive. And then from there, go to the Assets folder. Once you're at the Assets folder, just download bullet.png. So now once you have that file downloaded, just drag and drop it right here. This is Eclipse. You can drag and drop it right into the Assets folder, and then it will update for you. Because if you remember previously, the way that I said to do it was a very bad way. Where is that slide? There it is. I said to drag and drop it into the original folder. There is makes a lot of complications where if you don't do this, or if you do that, I mean, you would have to find the project right here and refresh it. So the easy way to get around doing that is to just, oh, so many slides, is to just drag and drop it directly into this assets folder right here. Got it in? All right. So now the next thing is we have our bullet image. Now, how are we going to store this? So did I miss a slide in here? No, all right. So now, uh, for right now, we want to have more than one bullet in the game because having just one bullet is not very fun. Uh -huh. So the best way that we're going to be able to store multiple bullets is to use an array. There's actually a better way of doing this, but we'll get to that a little bit later on. So right at the top of your jelly.java, we're going to add just this little line right here, which is character bullets equals new character 1000. So hopefully everyone here is familiar with arrays, and all this is doing is making an array of 1000 character objects. Now if you're wondering why I'm making this a character object, well, we'll actually get to that in the next slide. I remembered it this time. Okay, so the reason that I'm making this an array of characters and not like an array of bullets is because if you look back at our character file, these are the properties that they have. They have an X position, a Y position, velocity, and gravity. So now all of those are basically in common with a bullet, like there's no real distinction. And if you think about it, the only real difference between our bullet and our player is the picture that we're going to draw for them. So because they're more alike than different, it actually makes it very easy to implement. So now, the next thing that we're going to do is actually put that picture that we drag and dropped into our assets folder, we're going to load that up as another texture. So if you scroll to the very top of your jelly.java class, you'll see where we have a texture image. Now that texture image was what holds the picture for our player. So you can pretty much uh, duplicate that line, and instead of having texture called image, we'll create one called bullet. So now this texture object will hold the bullet texture that we're going to load up. So now if you scroll down a little bit, you should eventually find where we're setting image. So in this step two here, we have image equals new texture player.png. That's where we're actually loading up the uh, texture and storing it into our texture object. So, basically copy that line for the most part, and we're going to um, make that for bullets. So, we're going to assign a new texture from bullet.png, we're going to store that into bullet. Also make sure that there's a bullets with an S. And that one's, nope, we want a bullet here and bullets, they have to be different things. Alright, and then go to bullet.png. So now you should be all set here where you have the player is being loaded into IMG, this variable, 
and we have bullet.png is being loaded into bullet. So now, run your program. And the reason I'm saying to run your program is to make sure that you didn't get any exceptions. So if you have an exception, I'm going to go back a couple of slides here, there's a chance that you got this, oh, that's not an exception, this exception. If you got a file not found exception, except it says bullet.png, that means that you did not um, accurately put it in your assets folder. So a couple people yesterday had this put in the wrong assets folder. Remember you want to put all of these in your core project, not your desktop project. And also make sure that when you do this, that you refresh Eclipse here, which basically will refresh all of your files that you're using in your game. Okay, so now the next step that we're going to do is we need to actually create a bullet. So, so far all we've done is we created an array to store all of our bullets in. We loaded up a texture, or we created a texture, then loaded up the texture. But right now, nothing happens. So, if you go on and scroll right down to where we're handing all of the key input, which is right inside the render object in jelly.java, you can go ahead and make a, when you press a certain button, that we will fire a bullet. So in my case, I chose enter. So when the user presses enter, we're going to create a new bullet. So we have an array of 1,000 bullets. So I'm going to start out by setting the first element, which is bullets at position 0 here, to a new character. So when you initialize an array of 1,000 character objects, they're initially all null. So before you ha enter, your game will be filled with 1,000 nulls. As soon as you do hit enter, it's going to set the first one to an actual object. And when you click on new character, oh, I don't know, it says what do you think will happen when we run this? So, nothing. yes, nothing will happen yet because we didn't actually do anything. So now the next thing that we have to do is we actually have to draw the bullet because we created a bullet and it technically exists but we didn't actually draw it to the screen. So, go down to... I, I kind of have this out of context. Go find right where you have um, batch.draw, img, and then character. So go to the exact same line where you're drawing your character. And now this should be kind of near the bottom of your render method. So go ahead and scroll all the way down. So yeah, look for a thing that says batch.draw, img, int my character dot x my character dot y that's where we're drawing our character we're gonna draw our bullets right underneath him so add a line now there's a reason I have this little if statement here is I'm checking if bullets zero is not equal null that is very very important because if you do not have this your game will crash um, you start out with 1000 um, null bullets in your array and if we tried to call batch.draw and then we tried to access right here where my mouse is bullets 0.x if bullets 0 does not exist yet and we're trying to access the x position of it your game will crash so before we can draw it right here we have to make sure that it exists or that it is not null because an array starts out as everything null so when our game starts out bullet 0 will be null as soon as you press enter it should create an object at position 0. So bullet 0 then should be an actual thing, which then would allow this part right here to draw. So this exception here is, uh, if you have an exception when you're running this, it'll be a null pointer exception. And that literally means that you are trying to do something with something that does not exist. In this case, bullet 0 might not exist, and if you're trying to say bullet 0, which is null, dot x, you can't do null dot x, which means your game will crash. So this if statement around here is very, very important, and I'm sorry that it doesn't look like code. I had to add that in separately. So now if you run your game, you'll notice that you can move around, and as soon as you hit enter, you'll see a little circle appear up near the top. So it's just kind of sitting there. It's not really doing anything. And why is it doing that? It's because it's doing exactly what we told it to. We said as soon as we hit enter to create a new character object, and every character object, if you look back at your character constructor, it sets your x position to 200 and your y position to 200, which is the same place as where your character spawns.
Now the difference between your bullet and your character is your character has update being called on it, which applies gravity, but your bullet does not. So your bullet appears, is drawn there, but never moves. So the easy way to go about fixing that is to call update on it, just like how we call our character. So scroll in your code to where we have my character dot update. So right there is where we are applying gravity to our character. So with a little bit of thought, you can check if your bullet has gravity. So that would be done by adding this line right here, which is bullet zero dot update. Now once again, you have to check if it's not null in the same way that we drew it. Because if you try to call update on something that doesn't exist, your game will crash. It will give you a null pointer exception. Our bullet zero is null until you press enter. So as soon as we press enter, we can update it. But until we press enter, we don't want this code to run. So now, once again, go ahead and run your code. So now you should see your player fall, and then when you press enter, you should see a bullet up here at that same place, and then kind of fall until it almost hits the ground. Alright, um, keep in mind that every time that you press enter, you are overwriting bullet at position zero with a brand new bullet. So if you keep hitting enter, a new bullet will spawn and your old one will disappear. Mm -hmm. And that is because right now we have a bullet array of 1000, but for simplicity we're just starting with the first bullet. So right now you only have one bullet in the game. Alright, now one more thing to show you is the bullet is actually hitting the ground. Um, remember that the texture is 32 by 32, so there's kind of a little border around it. So here I'm actually drawing it where you can see the border. So the actual object is hitting the ground. So even though it doesn't look like it's quite getting all the way there, it is. So now the next thing is there's no point to have, yeah, you don't have to worry about the border yet. Um, I was just drawing those boxes, by the way, to visualize the actual picture. We'll get to adding those in later. Um, the next thing is a bullet that doesn't move side to side is pretty pointless. It's just a rock. Well, a rock that you can't even throw, so even worse than a rock. So the next thing that we're going to do is add some X velocity or movement to our character object. So if you go ahead and open up your character.java, we're going to modify this just a little bit. So if you remember, if you have a little bit of a background in physics, you should know that your X velocity, which is your side to side, and your Y velocity, which is up and down, do not ever change each other. They are completely independent. So gravity is completely unaffected by your x velocity, which makes everything a lot easier to program. We can handle our x velocity and y velocity completely separately. So the first thing that I'm going to have you do is right up at the top, right under velocity, create a new variable, which is a double, and we'll call that x velocity. And that will be how fast you are moving side to side. So for example, if x velocity is a positive number, you'll be moving to the right. And if x velocity is negative, you'll be moving to the left. Now, um, another problem that a couple of people had is they were setting their x velocity in their constructor. You do not want to do that. And the reason for that is, if you set your x velocity in your constructor, that means that uh, your player, when you create him, will have movement. Which means that if you set x velocity to a positive number in your constructor, which is this chunk right here, which you should not modify, then your player would automatically start moving to the left or the right or whatever you set it to. So we only want to do this for bullets. So this is kind of a distinction between our bullet and our character. So we're going to create a method right here, which is called set x velocity, and it does exactly what it says. It's going to take in a double of value right here, double v. We're going to pass in whatever we want, and we're going to set our x velocity to that value. So when someone calls this object dot set velocity, they can pass in a number and that will be the speed that it moves to the left or the right. Make sure that you get double x velocity at the top. You need, to, you need to have velocity and x velocity. So, this one? Nope. Copy that line right there. Yeah, make sure you get this top line in. Here. So we have velocity. Oh. Now you just need to add x velocity. Once again, um, these variable names are up to you to change. 
it was kind of a poor naming convention for me to name them velocity and x velocity so if you want to rename them now would be a good chance to name it y velocity and x velocity all right and then the very last thing is now we have this velocity and we want that to be applied to our our movement every frame so since we call update every frame we can then put this chunk of code in here so basically where we have y plus equals velocity we're going to do something very similar to that which is x plus equals x velocity so now the x velocity will be applied to it every time that we call update so now if you were to run your code nothing would happen because by default the velocity is going back to this velocity is set to we didn't set it so it's set to zero so now when we create our object so if you go back to your jelly.java, right where you press enter or whatever you key to have to fire, we have to do one more thing. So our first line of code creates a new character object, which is great. Everything has its default value. Now it stores it into position zero of our array. Well now we want to actually give it some speed. So we can access that variable that we just created by saying bullet at position zero and then type in dot and then Eclipse should give you a bunch of like autocomplete things. So go ahead and key down to the set x velocity. Then pass in any number that you want in here. The bigger the number, the faster it will move. And you should be all set. So what's going on here? Hover over that. Oh, you named it um, set x velocity. Yep. So yeah, this variable, depending on whatever you named it in your actual code, it has to match up exactly. So. Uh, right when you hit bullets zero, type in dot and wait for Eclipse to suggest things to you and then make sure that you have it right so that we don't have any spelling errors. You're free to name these methods whatever you want, I'm just trying to name them something that's easy to read. So now if you run your code, you'll have your character and when you press enter, you'll see that it's moving to the right as well as having gravity that affects to it. So it's still starting up at position 200, 200, which is right where our character spawns, but that's actually very easy to fix. So that's going to be our next thing, is we don't want our bullet spawning from some random place or the exact same place every time, but it makes more sense that we would shoot our bullet from our character. So hopefully, in order to do that, you should see that we need to set the position of our bullet to the same position as our character whenever we create it. So. The best way, this is a, uh, a very common way, whenever you're creating an object, we're going to, instead of just saying new character, uh, it's very common in video games for you to say a new character, and then you pass in a couple of arguments. So these arguments that we're going to decide to make here are going to be position variables. So every time that you make a character, now you have to specify where you want him to be placed. So if you go to your character.java file, the one on the left here, this picture, is what it looks like before we started. We have our x position is being set to 200 and our y position is being set to 200, which means that every character we create will start at position 200, 200. We then set our velocity to zero, which will then change as gravity increases. We're also setting our gravity variable here. So now we're going to modify this just a little bit. We want to set our x position to whatever they pass in and our y position to whatever they pass in. So if you look here on the right now, you have to add in two things inside of these parentheses. So now, the constructor of your object, so if you guys are in 1121, you might not have made very many constructors before, or any at all. So these work just like any other function or method. And what you do is you basically say what you're going to require they pass in, and then you can use those as normal variables. Um, I'm trying to kill two birds with one stone here by giving them the same name as a class level variable. And what I mean by that is, right here I'm naming this int x, and we have int y. If you remember, in our character class, we already have two variables called x and y, which are our positions. So now how would you differentiate between this x right here and our actual character's x, like the actual position that belongs to this character object? Well, if you ever have two things with the same name, you can type in this dot and it will access a variable that belongs to that character object. So when we type in this dot x, we're saying we want to set the x variable of our character object to x. And if you don't put this dot, it means to use this one. 
Now keep in mind, down here we're using velocity and gravity without saying this dot velocity and this dot gravity. You could add this dot and it would do the exact same thing. It only changes when you have two variables with the same name. Um, a nice easy way to check is all of these blue variables mean that they're class level variables, which means it's a basically a property of your character. And then these ones that are kind of grayed out looking are just ones that were being passed in, or temporary variables. So these blue ones belong to our object. So make sure you have the blue ones on the left, because we want to set those, and then something that's not blue on the right. So now what this is going to do is it's going to give you a bunch of errors in your jelly.java code. And the reason for that is, is before, if you look on this left picture, when you created a character object, you could just say new character, and you didn't have to pass anything in. Well now, every time that you create a character object, we're requiring that you pass in an X position and a Y position. So if you go back to your jelly.java, you can look right where those errors are coming from. So the first one that pops up is where we're setting my character equal to new character. So go to your jelly.java and look at that. So the reason that it's giving you an error is if you hover over it, can you hover over that real quick? it says the constructor character is undefined. And what that means is it's saying character, and then you see the two parentheses, meaning that it does not exist. You cannot create an object without passing parameters into it. So um, the solution to do that is to add some numbers in there, because now remember we're requiring that they pass in an X position and a Y position. So go ahead and throw two numbers in here, which are going to be 200 and 200. You can put these numbers as whatever you want. Those are just the position to start your character at. Um, if you set them as 0, 0, you'll start out in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. If you set them to a giant number, you might sp spawn off the screen or way up above the screen. So you can set this to whatever you want. I'm just setting it to 200, 200, which is the same position it was defaulted to before. So now you should have one more error, which is going to be wherever we're creating our bullet. So this one, instead of passing in a hard-coded number like 200, 200, we're going to set it equal to wherever our character is. So if you look here, this is what it, we had before, was just setting equal to a new character, which before would set it to a default position. Now we're going to spawn it at the exact same position as our character. So we're passing in two arguments here, which is the X position and the Y position. Well, what are the X position and the Y position that we want to start this bullet off at? We want that to be the exact same as our player's position. So, in your argument for bullets, you want to, uh, you're going to want to replace 200 right here. You don't want it to start there. You're going to pass in our X position of our character and our Y position of our character. So, right in there, type in my character. Right there. Right? Nope, inside the parameters. Because it requires that we pass in two variables, so we need to pass in the position of our character. And then type in dot. Yep. And now it's going to give you an error if you type in dot x alone, because um, if you remember, if you look back at our constructor, uh, we're saying that we require that you pass in two integer yep. variables. However, our player's x position in uh, how we represent it is a double. So we basically have to convert that from a double to an integer, which you can do by doing this right here, which is called typecasting. If you haven't seen that before, get used to it because you'll see it everywhere. So just put those little parentheses into parentheses, and that means we're going to tell Java that my character.x, we want that converted to an integer. Then we're going to do the same thing for my character.y. Oh, you need those. You actually will need those. 200, 200. Yep. So make sure that this one right here for my character, I just went back a slide by the way, make sure that these are still 200, 200 because our character, we're hard coding where we want him to spawn. Our bullets, however, we want to start all of our bullets wherever our player is at that second. So now if you go ahead and test your code, wherever your player is, is where your bullet will appear. So you can move around the entire game and your bullet will come right out of your player. Does that all make sense? All right. So that's the basic object. So that is why we're creating these objects for our characters, is because we can access all of the properties of them. So even though a bullet and our player don't really interact with each other, those objects, we were able to start the bullet off at the exact same position that our character started off at. Okay, so now we have one bullet, and that's not very fun.
if you remember, we created an array of bullets, which is 1,000 in size. So we might as well put that to good use. So now, how would you be able to keep track of bullets? The first thing is, our size right here will always be 1,000. So even if we start filling those in with bullets, our size will always be 1,000, which means that we need to keep track of how many bullets we have on our own. So go ahead and right under your bullets array, create something called bullet count, which will be an integer. Start it out at zero. So all this is going to do is then, starts out at zero, meaning that we have no bullets in the game, and then every time that we press enter, we want to basically create a bullet, which means that we will up this by one. So if we hit enter once, bullet count will be one. If we hit enter twice, it will be two. So the more times you hit it, the higher this goes. So let's actually do that. So if you scroll down to where we're pressing enter, we're going to change this a little bit. So we hard-coded zero in here, meaning that no matter what they do, we always want to override the first bullet, the first one in the array. So now what we're going to do is instead of having it at position zero, we're going to set it at position bullet count. So think about this real quick, is bullet count starts out as zero which means that the first time that we hit enter is going to create a bullet at our first position. And then the same line underneath it, it will set the velocity, the x velocity of that bullet to zero. And now the very last thing that we need to do is after you're done is increment bullet count. So bullet count plus plus basically means to add one to our bullet count. If you guys are in 1121, you probably have been told to not use plus plus. I have no idea why they're telling you to do that. But if you feel comfortable doing plus equals one, go ahead and do that. You can do bullet count equals bullet count plus one, just something that adds one to it. So that way, the next time that we hit enter, bullet count will be one, which means that we will set the first bullet to a new character, and then set the first bullet's velocity. So if you decided to test this out, you'll notice that you're still doing the exact same thing and you only have one bullet. And that is because um, we're only drawing one bullet in our draw code we're only drawing position zero. And we're also only updating position zero. So if you scroll down a little bit, you'll come to this chunk right here, which is where we are updating our bullet. So before what we were doing is it says, if our bullet at position zero is not null, because before we were only dealing with one bullet. And then what would happen is if it existed, we would update it. So now we can change this a little bit and we want to update every bullet that exists. So at any given time, we don't really know how many bullets we have but we want to update all of them. So we can easily do this with a for loop. So go ahead here and add a for loop to our update. You see our update right here, bullets not equal null. Change that entire if statement. Oh, another thing is, um, I'll get to this in a sec actually. So add a for loop right here. This will be replacing that entire if statement. So you're gonna have for int i equals zero So what int i equals zero means is it's going to start or counter at position zero. And then we're going to loop from zero, and then we're going to do that while i is less than bullet count. So, and then also do the i plus plus or i plus equals one, whatever floats your boat. So then what this will do, and then also change this, it was originally bullets zero dot update. We want to change that to bullets i dot update. So now if you notice I got rid of the check right here where it says if bullets whatever equals null or not equals null. You will not need that line of code anymore and the reason for that is um, before when we started our game we didn't know if bullet zero existed which is why we had to check if it did. Now if you look to our for loop what happens if we haven't pressed zero or if we haven't pressed enter yet? bullet count would be zero. So this would loop, it would start into i equals zero, and that would check, is i zero less than bullet count zero? So it's zero less than zero, it's not, so this would not ever run. So that, that avoids our null pointer exception. So this will only run if a bullet exists at that position. So if a bullet does not exist there, then this will not ever run. So we don't have to actually check if it's not equal to null. If you have that in there, it doesn't hurt. 
but it's unneeded. It will not, by the way that we set this up, it will never try to draw, draw a null or update a null. So now we updated all of our bullets. Now there's one last thing that we have to do, and that is draw them, because there's no point of having them in your game if you can't actually see them. So scroll down to where we have this statement here, which is um, if bullets not equal null, we're going to draw it. We're going to replace that with a for loop as well. This is the same for loop, but it's got to be different. It's just below. So replace that if statement with a for loop, and then change everything that was zero to i. So I'm going to give you a run through of what's going on here. Is so we have for int i equals zero, which starts our i at zero. We're going to loop while it's less than bullet count, and then increment i. And then for every one of those, for every time that we do that, we want to draw that bullet. So this is the exact same way that we drew before, which is batch.draw. We're going to draw it with a bullet texture, because we don't. it's saying what picture we want to use, and we loaded bullet.png into this bullet. And then we have to say what position we want to draw it at, which would be, uh, just look at this part, bullets at position i. So it's going to loop for every one, and then we want to have dot x, which gets the x position. Once again, we have to type cast here because x is a double, and libgdx wants an integer. So pass in this int. And then also for the second part here, we have bullets at position i. We want to get the y position, which is where we're going to draw the y position. And you also have to type cast it to an int as well. So if you go ahead and run this now, every single time that the game detects that you press enter, yeah, pardon the, the gif here, it's or gif, Still getting used to calling it a GIF. Um, every time that it recognizes that you hit something, it will then create a new bullet, and then from then on, it will draw that bullet and update that bullet. Now, um, if you look here, it says what happens when we try to fire our 1,000 and first bullet. So if you think about that, going back to our code, let's just do it with this one. Let's look at this for loop alone. If we went for i equals 0 and i is less than, in this case, 1,001, it would try to draw all 1,001 bullets. So it would try to access bullets at position 1,000. And if you remember, if we have an array size of 1,000, it goes from 0 to 999, which means that if we tried to access index 1,000, our game would crash because it's going to be an index out of bounds exception. So while in your real game you want to have infinite bullets, you don't want to be limited to how many bullets you can have, um, we set this to 1,000 just because it'll be big enough for now. Uh, later on, once we cover some more like data structures and you understand what's going on a little more, we'll come back, revisit this, and give you actual infinite bullets rather than just 1,000. So that is all we've got for the rest of this slide, but we are going to move on to one more thing, which is collision. Uh, once again, since you guys can't raise your hand right now, since you don't exist, well, you exist, but you're behind a computer, just uh, leave a comment in this video. Um, I will make sure to check them and answer any questions that you guys have. And if it's a good question, then I'll probably put a link in the video to answering it. So, for the next slide, we're going to get into some very basic collision. That's all right. That's a bad idea to do because um, that is a very large number. Okay. Go ahead and try it though. Um, right now, someone is trying to do a bullets array instead of having of size 1,000. They're doing integer dot max value. So uh, that'll be a loop. Now, if you do something like that and you set it to integer.max value, that is somewhere like, that's a 10 digit number or something like that, which is a giant, giant, giant number. And when you create an array, you're basically telling your computer, hey, put aside this much memory for me to use later. So 1000 in terms of computers is not very big. However, if you did integer.max value, you are going to try to save enough memory, like an insane amount of memory, and 
if you have a supercomputer, it will probably work, but it will be very, very slow. And if you don't have a supercomputer, and I'm talking like you might need like 16 gig of RAM or something like that to do this, if you don't have a supercomputer, it'll probably just crash telling you that there is memory out of bounds or memory request. Yeah. So the error, the actual error is requested array size exceeds virtual memory limit. So, or virtual machine limit. So yeah, make sure that you just keep it 1,000. We'll get back to making that infinite later. Next thing is collision. So, oh, all right, you can take it off. I'll just walk around through. All right, so, all right, that's fine. Collision is one of those things that most people hate, and that is because there's a lot of math going on. Um, it's something that is very hard to debug if you did it incorrectly, so you got to make sure that it works the first time. So this is where we left off. I hope you remember this because we just worked on it a couple of seconds ago. So now, what is collision? Collision is literally checking if something is colliding, uh, if something is touching. So now there is a lot of different ways that you can check for collision. Um, but keep in mind that the more in-depth you go, the harder it is on your computer to keep up. So one of the most common ways to approach this is to do a thing called a bounding rectangle, which is basically drawing a rectangle over your entire object and then using math to see if those two triangles, or triangles, rectangles are overlapping. So, real quick, are these overlapping? The answer is yes. So the reason I'm bringing this up is because I did a very bad job with my textures right now where they don't quite fill up the entire um, 32 by 32 box that they're being made for. So, for simplicity's sake, I'm going to actually have you download both of these files. Did I say that in the previous slide and just not pay attention? No, I did not. So it'll be the next slide. So, uh, the reason is, is it's a lot easier if you can see the rectangle over it while you're checking for collision, rather than just seeing things get somewhat close to each other and then something happening. So, go ahead and download these two files from Google Drive, which is going to be player underscore border dot png and bullet underscore border dot png. These are technically not needed, but they will make it a lot easier to debug to know if your player is colliding with something. For example, once we start adding walls in here, um, sometimes it'll look like he's getting kind of close to him, but not quite touching him, and that is not because you did something wrong programming, but because our picture is too big and our border is a little bit too big. So once again for simplicity we're going to not scale our borders down, we'll leave everything at 32 by 32. So now in the same way that we were loading our bullet um, into our assets folder, just drag and drop those files right here into this little assets folder. You can do it in Eclipse, it makes things a lot easier. Um, a pop-up will ask you if you want to copy or link, just hit copy. And now you should have all of these in your game. Now the next thing that we're going to do is uh, load these up. So um, instead of loading them up as new texture objects, we're just going to find where we were previous lo previously loading player.png and bullet.png and just add an underscore in here. So all this is going to do is load up um, the picture that has a border around it. It'll just make it a little easier to see. So if you test your game, you should now see like a basic little square around there. So the only thing that we changed was the picture that we're drawing. We're not drawing anything separate, we're just drawing, or changing what we're drawing. I don't know if that makes sense. So now, uh, to do collision, we're basically going to create an enemy, shoot at the enemy, and then do something about that. This is the most simple form of collision that I can think of. So in order to do that, we actually need an enemy. So we're going to go ahead and create another character. So I should have put red rectangles around this. But um, create this object right here, which is character enemy. All this is going to do is be another character in our game that we can interact with. So it's just like our player. So now we save the object. Now if you scroll down into uh, still on jelly.java, you want to go to the create section, which is where we basically initialize all of our variables. So, before we had my character equals new character, and we're setting it at position 200, 200, we're going to do something very similar to that, except we're now going to set the enemy. 
Now, the reason I'm setting this to 500, 200 is because I don't want them to spawn on top of each other. If you set them both to 200, 200, your player and enemy would spawn on top of each other. I'm setting this 500, which is our X position, to be a bigger number, which means our character will spawn at the same height, which is 200, but just a little bit further to the right. If you guys are wondering, the width of your screen is 640 pixels, and the height is 480. So, pretty much anything between 0 and 640 for the first value will work, and anything between 0 and 480 will work. You could put in anything, but if you make it less than or greater than that range, you're just going to draw them off the screen so you can't see them. So now the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to go, and we're just going to keep finding everything that we're doing for our character. So where we have mycharacter.update, we're going to go ahead and add, i got to stop moving my mouse so you can see this, as soon as it appears, come on, there we go. We're going to add in this enemy.update. So, by update, I mean this applies gravity. So now our player now has gravity. Well, now the most important part is making sure that we can actually see our enemy. So, right here is where we are drawing our player. And what this does is it draws, it's using batch.draw. Oh, another thing is, an error I saw yesterday was make sure that all of your batch.draws are between uh, batch.begin and batch.end. So what that means is you have this batch, which you can think of as like a whiteboard, this sprite batch. And you are basically telling the computer, okay, I'm going to start drawing to the screen with when you call batch.begin. And then when you're done, you say batch.end, which means I'm done drawing. And then what happens is it basically turns that into a picture and displays it on your screen. So, if you call anything outside of that range, your game will crash, because you're trying to draw after you told your computer, I'm done drawing, or before you told it that you're going to start drawing. So make sure batch.draws are all between batch.begin and batch.end. Next, if you notice, we're drawing IMG. IMG was our player texture. You can actually still see that up here. Okay, We're using the same texture for our enemy, just because it's easy. So... For our enemy, we're going to draw it with IMG, which is just our same player character, or player um, texture, the picture. So now instead of drawing it at position mycharacter.x and mycharacter.y, we don't want to draw it wherever our character is, but we want to draw it wherever our enemy is. So doing the same thing, basically the same thing, except we're going to say enemy.x, which is our enemy object here, and enemy y. So we're using the same picture, but we are going to draw it in two different places. So if you go ahead and run this, you'll see that we have our enemy that spawns. I think it will restart in this GIF here. You'll see him start at position 200, maybe. Yep, there he goes. Okay, so he starts at the same height as our character. He's just a little bit over. And then he falls and does absolutely nothing. He's being drawn, but we have no interaction with him whatsoever. So now, let's actually make it so when we hit him with a bullet, he'll do something. So now, how can you tell if our enemy is hitting a bullet, or if a bullet is hitting our enemy for that matter? So this is where collision comes in. So uh, this approach that I'm going to show is very, very common in game engines, and that's a method called is colliding. It's more often than not called is colliding too, so I would suggest sticking with this name. What this will do is, it's just going to be a basic thing that returns true or false, and it will tell you if this character object is colliding with another character object, which is something that you pass in. So for example, if this first character object, which is whatever this is, was our enemy, we could say if enemy dot is colliding with, and then in here we pass in another character object, which means we could pass in a bullet, then this would either return true if we're colliding with that bullet, or false if we are not colliding with that bullet. So go ahead and make this first thing. This is in character.java, not jelly.java. It's going to be specific to each character. So go ahead and add this first line. So we have our name is is colliding, and it requires one character object. And I'm just going to name it other. It's our other character. Now the next thing that we're going to do is there's actually a data structure that comes inside of um, 
libgdx, which is called rectangle. Um, that's going to be right here. We're going to create two rectangles, and all a rectangle is is basically a mathematical representation of a rectangle that is drawn over the top of our character. So I'm going to create one called this character and other character. You can name these whatever you want. You can call them R1 and R2 if you feel like it. So now the most important part is right here. We're creating a new rectangle. A rectangle takes in four arguments, which are shown right here, which is X position, Y position, width, and height. So in here, we're going to pass in for our this character, we're going to draw basically a rectangle over our character. So our X position and Y position are very easy. We just say X and Y. Once again, you have to cast them to integers because that's what it likes. And then width and height. What do we pass in for that? How wide is our rectangle and how tall is it? Well, if you followed along with me, all of our pictures are 32 pixels by 32 pixels. And the reason I did that was to make this method a lot easier. So go ahead and hard code in here 32 and 32. Later on, we'll find a way where every character can have a different size because obviously our bullets are a lot smaller than our player and we don't want to have the collision box be extremely big for them. But we'll get to that in the future. So this one will create a box around our character, whatever character this is. This is by character, I don't mean our player. I just mean whatever this object is, which is going to be at its x position, y position, and then with a width and height of 32. So now we're going to create a rectangle object over the other character, which is whatever they decided to pass in as this variable here, as this argument. So that's going to be very easy. How would we access the x position of that other character? You would access it by doing other.x and other.y. And once again, that just gets you the x position of the other character and the y position of the other character. So now we started it off there and there. Now we just need to specify the width and the height, which is, once again, going to be 32 and 32. All of our objects in this game will be 32 pixels wide and 32 pixels tall, for simplicity. So now we have these two rectangle objects. Congratulations, we didn't do anything with them, though. Now, um, this rectangle class has a very, very nice method. So it saves you a bit of math. Um, if you're interested in doing it, it's if you want to do it by hand, um, you can just Google rectangle to rectangle collision. It's a very easy math um, equation. You're just doing a, like four checks or something like that. Uh, but anyway, it gives you this easy method called overlaps, which does exactly what it sounds like. So what this will do is it uses two rectangles, and it will check if they are both overlapping. So ignore this return statement for right now. This is going to say this character, which is our first rectangle here, then we can type in dot, Eclipse will bring up a recommendation, just kind of look, look through all the methods, they're very useful, but one is called overlaps, and then it requires that we pass in another rectangle object. So we can pass in our other rectangle object. So now we have the rectangle that surrounds this character, and we're checking if it overlaps with the rectangle that we created around our other character. So now this method right here returns either true or false. So we can actually throw this all into one line by just saying return whatever this turns out to be, which means that if the rectangles are overlapping and this returns true, our method will return true. And if they're not overlapping and this part right here returns false, our method is colliding will return false. This is a very simple way to implement this, and it's also very important that you did it correctly. So now we have a method that just will return true or false if something is colliding. So now we can use that to actually check if two things are colliding. So if you go to our bullet update part, we're going to modify this a little bit. The best way to check if our bullets are colliding with our player is to go to the part where we're already looping through our bullets and just do a check in there. So what this does is it loops through all of our active bullets. So if a bullet doesn't exist, it doesn't loop for it. It only does it if it exists. So now in here, you can create a quick if statement. So right after we decide to update it, so we still have our update, Don't make, make sure you don't get rid of that line, we're just going to do a quick check. So if bullets at position i, which is whatever the current bullet we're looping through is, we can do dot is colliding, and then we're going to check if it's colliding with our enemy. So we pass in our enemy object. 
So now once again, this if it's true, that means that our bullet is colliding with our enemy. Um, remember that this whole inside statement will evaluate to either true or false. So if it's colliding, this will happen, this chunk of code here. If they're not colliding, it'll just skip over it. So now the next thing is, what do we want to do if they are colliding? So, you can do just about anything here. Um, whatever you want your character, your enemy to do, to react when he gets hit by a bullet. So, something that I decided was very easy, because it only takes one line to do, is to make him jump. And I decided to make him actually jump really, really high when he gets hit, so it's not just like our person jumping. So, inside of this if statement, if they are colliding, I went and said enemy.velocity, which is his gravity basically. We're going to set that, or not gravity, it's his falling speed. We're going to set that to 5, and since it's positive, it'll make him jump upwards. So, this is a very easy thing. It's going to loop through every bullet, check if the bullet is colliding with our enemy, and if it is, it's going to make our enemy jump upwards. So let's go ahead and test this out, and it looks like everything's working. Um, if you have any errors, you might want to go back, and I mean, I can't take a look at it from here, but make sure that you're not doing any copy-paste errors. How's it going? So, that's pretty much all I've got for today. Yep. Uh, if you have any questions, just post them in the comment section. Sorry. Didn't know you were...